Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. So after uh, the session on how uh, corporate companies, how to talk about corporate companies in the media, uh, we're going to do a one-on-one -on -one with a great American media entrepreneur, uh, Ben Smith, sorry, uh, joining us from uh, New York City through a video call. A Yale alumni, Ben Smith started uh, his career as a correspondent in Latvia, where he worked uh, for the Baltic Times. Back in the US, uh, he went crazy with uh, blogging on New York politics, which convinced uh, Politico to hire him as a reporter, covering the 2008 uh, Democratic presidential primary with uh, Barack Obama back then. Then he joined BuzzFeed, where he started uh, the news division and was editor-in-chief there for eight years. Uh, he then left for the New York Times, uh, where he was their media columnist, before uh, leaving uh, two years ago to co-found Semaphore, a fresh global news website, uh, with another Smith, not related, Justin Smith, uh, who was the CEO of Bloomberg uh, Media Group. Uh, this spring, Ben published a book called Traffic, Genius, uh, Rivalry and Delusion in the Billion Dollar Race to Go Viral. Uh, everyone in the audience, you're welcome to share and comment the exchange uh, on social networks uh, using the hashtag Media uh, Ben, thanks a lot for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, your book tells the story of a decade, uh, the 2010s, uh, where we've seen the rise and fall of a media pure players in the U.S., such as uh, the Unfiction Post and BuzzFeed. There was also woman-centric Jezebel, which just announced last week that they were closing. Why did the 2010s media boom went completely bust? Well, I think, you know, I know that in, in France, everyone uses this term pure play. But, but I guess I really think of that generation as having been wedded to social media. For companies like BuzzFeed, Vice, Vox, Huffington Post, you know, and, and all the Ingawker and all the others, there was this idea which seemed, you know, very clear and true at the time that social media was rising, you know, and social media was the wave of the future. And for a lot of the people involved in, in that moment, they believed it would be what cable had been in the United States, this new form of distribution that would bring with it a new form of media. And, you know, there were a, a million kind of mistakes and errors and, you know, bad decisions made during that decade. But I think the core thing was that social media did not turn out to be a good form of distribution for professional media. And also social media itself, you know, has basically collapsed in many ways. Did you have doubts about the strategy on relying so much on, on Facebook, especially at BuzzFeed when you were there? Did you try to push for another strategy? Um, you know, it's, it's funny to kind of go back to what you were thinking in 2010, 2011. But actually, I mean, BuzzFeed's core bet was on social media. And I, I had been a political journalist blog, blogging back when blogs were you know, a thing, um, and had seen the energy that, that surrounded blogs and the audience that surrounded blogs move to social media, and it felt like this very natural evolution of the direction of the Internet. And I think back then we had no question that it was the future, and, and our whole strategy was to connect ourselves to it. Um, you know, I think that started to change around maybe 2015, 2016, with the rise in the U.S. and Britain, elsewhere, of a kind of right-wing populism that made, you know, that, that made the platform scared of news, actually, was in some ways the biggest issue. Do you feel that uh, social media era uh, is, is totally over? Uh, what was it replaced with? Yeah, I mean, it's wild. You know, when I was when we were starting Semaphore, um, I guess about more than a year ago, uh, when people asked me what we were doing, I would say, well, this is a post social media media company, although I didn't really know what that meant. I just kind of liked the sound of it. Um, but I think, you know, a year later, it's so clear that if you, you know, for people who thought that for, you know, who for whom Twitter was the central channel of hard news, doesn't work anymore. It's broken. And, you know, for 
institutions and consumers for whom Facebook was this very, very, you know, the most important distribution channel. You know, they're basically out of that business now. Um, and so I think the challenge now is to, you know, is to sort of serve consumers who are in a very different place. You know, I think who miss what was good about social media, the ability to hear from many different sources, many different voices, but who also are really struggling to figure out, you know, where to find any, anything to trust. Uh, in your book, you tell, you explain how much you were addicted to Twitter, uh, even saying that sometimes a discussion on uh, that network felt more real than uh, a real discussion in real life. I'm wondering now that Twitter has changed with Elon Musk, uh, what's your vision of that platform? And um, have you reversed to maybe uh, old old school kind of journalism if you cannot do your work there uh, anymore, find sources there anymore? Yeah, I mean, I definitely, you know, was sort of an addict. And honestly, I really liked it. Like, I, I, I was not someone who thought it was the worst place in the world. But I think you could see before Musk that it was in decline. I mean, these social platforms, I think we thought that they were like like pipes, that they were like the plumbing of the Internet. But really, they were like, you know, a restaurant or a nightclub where people are there for a while. They like it because and they go because their friends are there and then everybody leaves. And you don't really know why. It's just the moment changes, the scene changes. And I think that was really already happening before Musk. Um, the yeah, now I think I think a lot of consumers, including me, are trying to figure out how do you you know, how do you hold on to what was good about the Internet, which was the openness but then find other sources of all this information. I mean, that's 100% of what we're trying to do at Semaphore. And, but I think more broadly, you see this generation of companies using email, which is this funny technology, you know, it's like from the 1990s. It's sort of halfway in between print and, um, and the internet. And I think a lot of, you know, right now, there's a lot of energy there. Mm-hmm. How, how big is, is this channel for you, email today? How, how many of your audience are you, are you reaching out through email? Yeah, we're approaching, I mean, at Semaphore, we're approaching 500,000 um, email, email subscriptions, which we feel really good about. It's, it's, you know, it's a more reliable, more direct, and more, you know, sort of monetizable uh, channel than, the, certainly than the social web. Why is it more monetizable? Because you know who you're reaching, because you can, you know, do very detailed, you know, anonymized but detailed research on your audience and know that you're reaching them and tell advertisers who you're reaching. But at the same time, isn't it a, a too crowded space already? Like so many people have subscribed to a newsletter and they don't open it. I think, you know, it's a very I would say it's a competitive space. It's crowded because it's where it's where people are consuming. Um, I think, you know, nobody wants bad emails. It, it makes it competitive and means that you have to do a good job. But I think that, yeah, I think there's always sort of a truism in media that like, oh, I don't want to go where, you know, that's too crowded. But of course, it's crowded because that's it's because it's where, you know, it's where consumers are. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, Semaphore? Uh, what is it? Uh, what? Why did you decide to launch like a global news website in 2022 when most of the other players decided to be specialized on a niche? Yeah, I mean, I think we were thinking a lot about these, you know, these basic challenges that I was talking about before. And I was I had been the media columnist for The New York Times for a couple of years. My partner was the CEO of Bloomberg. And I think we were seeing kind of the same thing that we we're in the middle of this huge change that, um, you know, that, that I think a lot of the traditional media, the New York Times, Le Mans, the Washington Post, are, you know, were relieved to see the Internet go away and to say, OK, we can go back to paywalls and walled gardens and put up high walls and, and you know, just bring consumers into our ecosystem. Um, and then the social media is increasingly unreliable and kind of strange and broken. And but for consumer, but there's this huge opportunity to say that, you know, to serve consumers who want who want multiple sources, but who also care about trust and authority and quality. And so, yeah. And so I think that's I mean, that's sort of that's really our core, I think, insight into into the market. Um, 
so and certainly, you know, in in 2023, that means global perspectives. And I think if you think about the big stories of this era about COVID or about social media or about the rise of the far right, you just can't understand them as national stories. It doesn't make any sense to understand, you know, Donald Trump without thinking about Bolsonaro and Le Pen and Boris and things like that. And so I think that's something that consumers also are sort of coming around to. How much of your coverage is uh, U.S.-based versus other countries? It's, we launched in the in two places in the U.S. and in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. I think we, you know, we have big ambitions, and and but also Justin and I have, and I'm sure many of the people in in, in your audience have done this before and know that part of the goal is to not spend all your money at exactly the same time and to build very cautiously. And so we wanted to, you know, launch both in, you know, the biggest market, the market we're from and the place where that, that is where it makes sense to build your business, which is the United States. And then, you know, take the fastest growing, in some ways, most open market for competition, which is that which is which is sub-Saharan Africa, the you know biggest GDP growth, biggest population growth and a place where there's a, you know, big and growing professional class who are really hungry for quality news that's, you know, that's that's for them. And so, so we kind of started at those two poles and I think are hoping over time to fill in the middle. Mm -hmm. it, it's quite rare to see a, an American um, media to focus on Africa. Um, why did you decide to do this? And uh, is it mostly to target an audience that's in Africa or do you feel there's also interest in, in the U.S. or other countries to read more about those countries? Um, you, you know, I think we sort of see it as a long-term bet on, you know, a kind of global future where a lot of the energy is to the east and to the south. And I think the normal, the typical expansion for a, a U.S.-based media company is is to go to London or to go to Brussels. And I think we wanted to sort of signal our direction. Um, but, but also, there's a big audience of people, um, you know, we have, and I don't want to, I'm not an expert in African journalism, but our, our Africa editor, Yink Adagoke, is a you know great veteran of this space. So I'm just kind of, kind of quoting him. I don't want to claim false, false expertise. But I think, you know, our view of the audience is that it's, is that there's a world of kind of global Africans, of people who are in Kenya, you know, in Nigeria, in South Africa, in other countries, but also in London, in New York, in Houston, in Paris, and back and forth between those places and on WhatsApp, and who read the Financial Times, who read Le Monde, who read the New York Times, and appreciate, you know, the quality, the technical quality of that journalism, but also who don't, you know, don't see themselves in that coverage, and they're interested in the things that you're interested in when you live in a place, not in foreign correspondent coverage of the place. Mm -hmm. And so if you can try to find, you know, do work at that quality, but really aim it at people who are there and have by Africans, for Africans in that market. There's just, there's a big audience for that. When you launched, you also say you wanted to reinvent the format uh, of the article. Can you explain a little bit more uh, what you mean by that? What, what have you been doing to reinvent it? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, obviously one of the huge challenges is, is trust and is, you know, particularly for a new publication, Is, but but also for traditional ones, particularly I think in the American media, you read an article and you don't really know where the opinions are coming from. You know, are they the opinion of the journalist or are they the opinion of the of the publication or do they come from somewhere else? And I think we wanted to say, so, so we've broken down our, our just basic news article format into something we call the semaphore. Um, where we essentially separate the facts from the opinions. We give the, you know, people know that reporters have a point of view, particularly if the reporter is truly an expert in the subject. Mm -hmm. They're curious what the reporter's point of view is, and if they don't state it, they kind of know that the journalist is hiding it. But so we try to say, look, we can separate the facts from our opinion, and we separate them. And then we also make sure to include, you know, disagreeing views and different views from all over the world on, you know, on whatever we're writing about. Um, what's your business model today? Because today you're free, which is pretty rare in uh, uh, new media launching recently. Why uh, this choice? And um, is it uh, going to be free uh, on the long run? Yeah, I mean, you know, we think, you know, we wanted, let's see, 
I don't think I think advertising is not that not that exotic a business. And I think Justin's view and mine is that people get too kind of ideological about business models. You know, people who have advertising say that it's great for democracy and because everyone can read it. And people who sell subscriptions say that it's not corrupted by advertising. But I think, you know, news is a pretty tough business and I have a lot of respect for all these different paths. For us, you know, we, we, we've been able to build a really strong advertising business and an, and an events business as well, mostly in Washington. Um, and that's, that's most of our revenue right now. I think we would anticipate doing some paid products down the line, but I don't really think those are sort of philosophical mm-hmm. decisions. I mean, I think you, I think they're business decisions based on how you can best support your journalism. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you integrate uh, ads? I mean, I, I know there's been some controversy around some ads you're integrating. Uh, for instance, there was a reporter uh, who left the company after there was a Chevron ad, a reporter covering a climate change crisis. Um, he felt that it was uh, too too strong. It, it was contradicting the content he was producing. So how, how do you deal with this? Yeah, I mean, I think we have the same approach. We have advertising guidelines on our website that are the same as everybody else, you know, very much the same as the New York Times or anyone else. And, you know, take take advertising from all sorts of big companies and put them into our products. And I, I mean, I understand there is a campaign to ban oil advertising, mm-hmm. which, you know, I, which is an interesting story. And I've covered it and I have respect for it. And some people believe oil companies shouldn't be allowed to advertise. But I actually, as a journalist, kind of feel like, you should have a wall between that the, the kind of separation between advertising and editorial goes in both directions. And I'm just as happy to not, you know, to not be endorsing or vetoing advertisers. So that's, that's, we have a very traditional approach in that way. The design of your website feels very newspaper-like, almost has this uh, financial time uh, kind of uh, design to it. Why did you make that choice to have a, a kind of a, traditional print uh, feeling to it. Yeah, it's fun. I, I, that is the choice. Um, I, I mean, I think that we're trying to combine, you know, essentially very traditional news values with the best of digital journalism and to find a kind of synthesis there. And I think our design is trying to reflect that. Um, do you see any, any future for print newspaper? Um, I mean, I, I feel like I should stop making predictions because I've been wrong about so many things, <laughs> but it doesn't seem like cutting down lots of trees and, you know, chopping them up and then printing them and putting them on trucks is like the best way to get you a piece of information. So I don't, I don't know. I think they're probably continuing to decline. Print revenue is still obviously declining. I, I do think that you're starting to see print reemerge as a kind of luxury product, My favorite, my kind of favorite publications right now are these sort of quarterly print magazines. There's one called Racket. If you play tennis, there's one called Stranger's Guide. They're these sort of beautiful, beautiful, expensive, infrequent print publications where, you know, that really create an object that you want to hold on to. And I, I think that's really interesting, actually, as sort of a luxury product in media. But I don't think it's the most efficient way to distribute information. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't go that way. You know, I love the idea that like we could like once a year print a little book or something. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. It's a lot of work. It's very fun, but a lot of work <laughs> to make print. It's my experience. Um, maybe one last question. Wondering, um, how do you see the role of AI in your newsroom? Uh, do you use it today? Do you plan on using it? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, you know, I saw somewhere it was reported that um, that maybe it was Wired had published a code of ethics that they would say that, that AI could be used to brainstorm stories, but not to write them, which seems to me like totally backwards. Like, obviously, you don't want, you know, hallucinating chatbots making any important decisions or, you know, or, 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 or you know, making the kind of decisions that people rely on human journalists and trust human journalists to do. But I think AI tools can do a lot on the back end and, and a lot of production support. I think, you know, they're good at copy editing. There's great software called Grammarly, 
which I suppose is kind of AI. And I don't think anybody thinks that like grammarly robots will be on street corners gunning people down. Um, you know, there's some interesting stuff you can do with tagging. And so we're, we're using it as much as we can actually, but largely for the kind of time consuming manual lower end stuff. But actually I have no objection if a journalist wants to write her draft or his draft in, um, using the software. Like I think, I think writing in some ways is an overvalued skill in journalism when the core skill is really finding out information. <laughs> and, you know, in American journalism, at least over time, it's become dominated by people who went to fancy universities and are good writers. And it used to be a much more working class profession where somebody might pick up the phone and say, in like in the old movies and say, get me rewrite. That's kind of chat GPT, right? Yeah. You're right. <laughs> We can see it this way. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ben Smith, for uh, joining us today. Uh, and thank you, everyone. Uh, you can continue to attend a conference here at Les Echo uh, headquarters or uh, Radio France, uh, La Maison de la Radio. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much. And thanks, Les Echo.